You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. The Comstock Act, it's back, baby. Back in the news, back in the conversation, not back in force, at least not yet. But that is what Clarence Thomas, who should be rotting in a prison cell somewhere for taking bribes, and Samuel Alito, who should be fucking all the way the fuck off somewhere, it is what both signaled or both stated they wanted during oral arguments at the Supreme Court last week about basically banning the sale of Mifepristone, one of the two medications that women take to safely terminate unwanted pregnancies in the privacy of their own homes which for many women in red states is their only option, and it is an option that millions of women have availed themselves of since the Dobbs decision overturned Roe v. Wade a couple of years ago, which resulted in abortion services being banned or severely restricted in more than 24 states, and yet the abortion rate in the United States because of medication abortion and because you can send these pills through the mail has not gone down. This fact is driving abortion opponents crazy. So crazy that they're talking about bringing back the 151-year-old Comstock Act, which, while still on the books, hasn't been enforced for more than 100 years. The people who want to shrink the size of government, who want to make the government so small they can cram it all the way up your vagina, want to bring back a law that empowered the federal government to suppress, quote, trade in and circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use. That included suppressing information about contraceptives, contraceptive devices, abortion medications, and so much more. Abortion medications that were very dangerous then and are perfectly safe now. Quoting from a piece by Jonathan Friedman and Amy Werbel in The Hill, the Comstock Act granted unprecedented and sweeping powers to government officials to search people's private mail, to confiscate and destroy published materials, and to fine and imprison writers and booksellers, as well as anyone found in possession of material deemed illicit. Millions of books, newspapers, magazines, prints, photographs, and circulars were burned under court order. More than 3,000 persons served a total of 600 years in prison, most for writing about atheism homosexuality, and sexual health. That is what abortion opponents, forced birth advocates, want to bring back. Two justices on the Supreme Court were willing to go on the record last week supporting a revival of the enforcement of the Comstock Act, and we don't know if any of the other conservative justices on the Supreme Court right now support bringing back enforcement of the Comstock Act. You know, back in 2016, Hillary Clinton got a lot of grief for tweeting that Donald Trump, if elected, could wind up appointing up to three justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. She said that should scare all of us. Donald Trump was elected and appointed three justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. Turns out she was right. We should have been scared. They may not have the votes right now, or they may. The other conservative justices have not gone on the record about the Comstock Act. They might soon, though. But they didn't have the votes once to overturn Roe. Didn't have the votes until they did. May not have the votes right now to revive the Comstock Act or Comstock laws. There were many of them. Or they might. We will find out soon enough. But if they don't, another two or three Trump appointees picked by Trump expressly to give abortion opponents what they want right now. Banning the sale and shipping of abortion pills through the mail. Opening and reading people's mail. Throwing people in jail for writing about homosexuality, contraceptives, abortion care, atheism. Two more, three more Supreme Court justices appointed by Trump, and it's going to be 1873 all over again, which is why we need to reelect Joe Biden. No president is perfect. No one gets everything they want out of a presidential administration. We all get some things we don't want. We get some things we hate. But presidents are for right now. Supreme Court justices, well, they're not quite forever but they stick around for a lot longer. And they're wreaking havoc right now with a 6-3 conservative majority. Imagine the damage they could do with a 7-2 conservative majority, or God forbid, an 8-1 or a 9-0. If I may paraphrase, the next president of the United States could be Donald Trump and could wind up appointing two, possibly three justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. And yeah, that should scare you. 
it didn't scare you in 2016, it should scare the shit out of you now. It sure scares me. All right, coming up on today's show, tons of your Q, lots of my A, and joining me on the Magnum, Dr. Eric Sprankle, author of a new book that could not have been mailed to your home and would have been illegal for you to possess when the Comstock Act was enforced. Dr. Sprankle's new book, DIY, The Wonderfully Weird History and Science of Masturbation. We talk about wanking, semen retention, that bizarre movement, orgasm-induced headaches, fetal masturbation, and more. Dr. Sprankle's book is fascinating. I think our conversation is fascinating. All right, let's get to the show. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. This episode is brought to you by Talkspace, therapy made easy. Get $80 off your first month when you go to Talkspace.com slash savage and enter promo code SPACE80. This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep, the best mattress for your individualized comfort. Right now, my listeners get 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage. Hey, Dan, Nancy, and the tech savvy at-risk youth. I am a single gay man in my late 30s who recently moved to the Pacific Northwest. I came out at age 30 because I grew up very religious, and it took me years to accept who I am. Since moving to my new city, I've made some meaningful connections with different men who are married or in open long-term relationships. The sex we have is incredible, and I also feel like many of them have a lot of the qualities I'm looking for in a boyfriend or partner. We seem to have a genuine connection, but once we're finished, they go back home to their significant others, and I'm left by myself. The sex is great, but I do want to build a life with somebody. As I get older, I become more and more afraid that I will end up alone. I'll go out on dates, but the prospects at my age seem to be recently out of a long-term relationship and not interested in anything serious, or I'm just simply not attracted enough to them. None of them seem as good or as exciting as the unavailable guys that I fuck. I've struggled with dating since I came out, and my longest relationship was nine months long. I want to fall in love with someone who's just as excited about me as I am about them, and it seems like everyone else gets to have that. I also feel like I missed out on a lot of formative gay experiences in my 20s, and now I'm way behind everybody else. Lately, I've also been thinking that I probably need to stop spending time with these married guys and focus on dating, but then I crave the available sex and the intimacy, and I just fall back into it. So what do you think, Dan? Do I stop hooking up with these guys so I can focus on dating single men? Or do I just go with the flow and not turn my back on these connections that I'm making? My advice when someone asks if I should get on the dating apps or I should try to meet people in real life, the old-fashioned way, moving through the world, is yes, both. Move on both fronts. Get on the dating apps, but also leave the house. I think you can make an effort to locate in your area the single and available gay men that you might want to date and fuck and have a relationship with, while also continuing to hook up with the married gay men that you enjoy having sex with and enjoy the company of. Because you never know. You might meet a single person and that could take off. You could have a relationship and you could be the husband, the exclusive partner of that one guy and have an amazing time. You could also, it is possible, you might meet somebody who's partnered, somebody who's married, and but emotionally available to you in you know, a more profound way than most married men are emotionally available to the guys they see on the side. There are definitely guys out there who are just looking for sex from other guys. They have uh, an open marriage, but they're not looking for a boyfriend as an individual or for a boyfriend as a couple. But there are married men out there who are emotionally available and could be good partners, plural, to you. And I think you should be open to that possibility, just like the person wondering where to meet people, open to all possibilities. Be on all the apps and leave the house and go do shit and see, see who you might run into. Get out there. Suck all the dicks. Suck the single dicks. Suck the married dicks. Be open to a relationship developing, which could develop with a single guy or it could develop with a 
partnered guy or a married guy. I have seen it happen. I know it is a thing. I'm living it, right? You could wind up living it too. Just be open to anything with anyone. You know, people rule people out. They say, oh, well, we met on Grindr. We had a sleazy hookup. There, therefore, no relationship could possibly. And if that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, you actually then can't have a relationship with the nice guy you met on Grindr and had a hot hookup with and felt like you clicked with because you've convinced yourself that's not possible with somebody that you had a very sleazy hookup with the first time because you believe all the friends and family versions that you've heard of how other people's relationships got started. And you don't want to do the same thing about the guys you date, the guys you hook up with, the guys you have sex with. You don't want to tell yourself, I couldn't have a meaningful, important relationship with someone who is married because they're married. Because then you're not going to ever, with somebody who's married, have that kind of relationship, which you might have of if you weren't imposing on yourself that limiting, self-fulfilling prophecy. You just never no. So get out there. Yeah. Maybe you sleep with a little fewer married men. So it creates some pressure. Uh, you're putting some pressure on yourself. You're creating a little bit of a vacuum that you're going to suck in some more single guys. Cause you're going to work a little harder to go find those single guys. But also there's a married guy that you like that you click with and you want that dick. Go get that dick. And then if that married guy wants to hang out with you or wants to introduce you to his husband, be open to what could wind up being a very beautiful relationship with a couple. Hi, Dan, Nancy, and the tech savvy at risk youth, long time Magnum sub, cishet 46 year old man in the Midwest. What I have might be more of a parenting question than a sex question. I am honestly in the healthiest, sexiest, by far best relationship of my life with an age-appropriate GGG mother of three. And in October, we decided to buy a big ranch-style home together and move in with our blended family of six total, including my teen son. The issue we need advice on is how to best deal with her teen daughter's total repulsion at her mother and my affection for one another, or worse, I rate an immediate outburst if she can detect any sounds of sexual activity happening on the other side of a closed door. Yes, I understand the disgust. A teen or anyone, for that matter, may feel the thought of their parent getting it on. But we think it has gotten a little bit ridiculous in our case. For instance, if her mother and I kiss with an affectionate but clearly PG level of affection, she can invariably be heard like fake retching and not in a way that I think is meant to be playful ribbing. And if she can detect us having sex in our bedroom late at night with the door closed, she will pound on the wall, call her mom's phone to say, stop it, and then angrily hang up. We try putting the TV in the room and, air quotes, watching a TV show to provide some distracting noise. Uh, we've used sounds for sleep white noise to drown out the sound of us not lying completely still in bed together. My girlfriend's daughter owns some really nice noise-canceling over-ear headphones. So I think she would rather just like not use them because she wants to shut us down. Her daughter's 15 and in a lot of ways she's very mature for her age. She regularly consumes adult romance novels, occasionally makes and laughs at dirty jokes, definitely knows all about what sex is, in theory at least, though we're pretty certain she's not sexually active, nor romantic, nor does she want to be. She's only at our house about half the time, the rest of the time she's at her father's house. So what's the right answer here? My girlfriend and I have strong and well-matched libidos, and we sleep together in the same bed, usually naked. Would abstinence even be a sex-positive message to send? In attempts to discuss this before, she's expressed that she likes us together, and she likes her mother being happy, and she wants this life that we've made together as a blended family. She just doesn't like us, you know, doing any of that. You can be mad or you can laugh. I think laughing at her might be the better option. Sit her down say, look, together with your girlfriend, we're in love and we are going to be having sex and this is our house and we are adults and we are going to have adult sex in our house. We know it bothers you. That's ridiculous. You're just going to have to get over it. Maybe part of the solution is moving her to a different bedroom. Why is the kid who can't stand the sound of her mother getting pounded out in the next room in the next room? 
Sounds like there's lots of kids who live in this house. Maybe there's a kid who'll swap bedrooms with her. But you can't let her clear attempts to control you and to stop you two from having sex when she's in the house, stop you two from having sex when she's in the house. She's having a tantrum. Tantrums continue when tantrums work. So when she pounds on the wall, you keep pounding her mom. Keep going. And then mom should go talk to her afterwards and say, that is rude. That is unacceptable. And it needs to stop. You need to get over it. Maybe a little bit of anger mixed in there with the humor. There's also, you know, regarding this as temporary, one of the, I think, plagues of parenthood is whatever stage you're in begins to feel like a stage you're never going to exit. It will always be thus and therefore we need to solve this problem because it's not going to work itself out in time. We will, you know, it's going to be like Groundhog Day. We're just going to live this day forever and ever and ever with your girlfriend's daughter pounding on the wall. You know, she'll probably get over this in a year or two. In three years, she'll hopefully be off to college or wherever the fuck. And right now she's only in your house half the time. So you can gamify it a little bit. Might actually be kind of sexy for you two to have to sneak around a little bit like kids, afraid of getting caught, afraid of being overheard. So you're in bed at night and she's in her room refusing to put her noise-canceling headphones on. Go fuck in the car. Go fuck in the kitchen. Go fuck in the rec room. Go fuck on the roof. Go fuck in the yard. Go fuck in a sex. Go fuck. Don't not fuck, but just allow you know, her shitty overreactions to inspire you two to keep mixing it up and having a little bit of fun together inspired by her. You can let her know that that's what you're doing. Hey, we're not fucking any less. Actually, we're having a lot more sex and a lot more interesting sex in crazy places to avoid assaulting your ears. So yeah, tantrum not working. Time for tantrum to stop. She's clearly being ridiculous and controlling and petulant and a teenager. Sometimes the best reaction when a teenager is being ridiculous and petulant is not punishment, not screaming and yelling, is laughter, laughing in her face. And then communicating to her, of course, what is and isn't acceptable. And what she's doing is unacceptable. Make sure she gets gets it through her head that what she's doing isn't going to change what you two are doing in the next room. And there's another form of punishment that can act as a disincentive, which is engaging with your children about sex, talking to them about sex, saying to her, obviously you have some issue here around sex. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it at length. Let's keep talking about it. If each time she pounds on the wall, she has to sit down with mom or mom and mom's boyfriend and have a conversation of about what the hell is going on here and why it's going on, that might act as a disincentive. That might stay her hand, prevent her from pounding on that wall. If each time she pounds on the wall, it means a long, drawn-out, open-ended conversation with mom and her boyfriend about what the problem is. This episode is sponsored by Talkspace. I know from listening to so many of your calls that a lot of folks out there need therapy. I'm one of those folks out there that has needed therapy. It is easy, I know, to make excuses, to put it off. And not being able to find the time to get to an appointment or afford therapy, those may be the top two excuses. Where Talkspace can really help you out. Because by doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want and need easy, accessible, and affordable. With Talkspace, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. It's so convenient to have these virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home. There's no need to commute to appointments. You won't have to miss time at work or line up childcare in order to attend your sessions. It's mental health care made easy. Talkspace also lets you send messages to your therapist so you don't have to wait for your next appointment to roll around to get a little input and help. Talkspace can help with any specific challenge you might be facing. It's the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, LGBT issues, and much more. Talkspace is affordable and in-network with most major insurers. 
As a listener of the Lovecast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash savage and enter promo code SPACE80 to match with a licensed therapist today. Go to Talkspace.com slash savage and enter promo code SPACE80 to get $80 off your first month and show your support for the show. More importantly, you'll be showing your support for yourself. That's Talkspace.com slash Savage, promo code SPACE80. Hey, Dan and the rest of the crew. I am a 21-year-old cisgender bisexual female. I am in nursing school. I work part-time. I'm very busy. My partner is in the trades. He works 10-hour days. He's very busy and very tired. We are both very tired. We've been together two years. We've lived together most of it, and we are very in love. And I couldn't imagine myself being with anyone else. We have great sex when we have it. Here's the problem. So our first year, we had sex very often, very often. um, And I was in school a little bit less. Um, My classes weren't as hard, so I had more of a drive. I was less stressed. Now that I'm nearing the end of nursing school, I am busy all the time. I am stressed all the time. And my sex drive is taking a dent. Um, I am still very mentally horny. But when I think about the act of physically carrying out what I'm visioning in my head, I just get exhausted. And my partner is tired too. And we have only been really having sex like twice a month when we used to have it multiple times a week in our first year of our relationship. Um, I know that it's normal for sex drives to kind of teeter off after the first year, I guess from what I've really been hearing, I don't know. Um, And I'm just asking for your help. I mean, I'm trying to get my want to act on it, urge back. And I know there are a lot of other factors that are really hindering my sex drive, like working, school, and all that stuff, constantly studying, constantly stressed. And, you know, it's the same for my partner. And I just miss wanting to act on it all the time, having the urge. I've gotten Dipsy, and I love Dipsy. I am trying to read more spicy books. Um, I'm just really trying to get the urge back to want to act on it, to want to pounce on my partner. What can I do to get that urge back to want to act on it? Or should I just not put pressure on myself and wait to get that urge back until I graduate and I'm a little less stressed in the long run? I I don't know. Here's what you do. You go to your partner and you say, I want to have sex more, but not right now because right now I'm wrapping things up in nursing school. The workload is crushing. I'm under a lot of stress and I'm exhausted, but it doesn't mean I'm not horny and I don't want you. You need to beware of creating a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If the story you tell yourself is we're having sex less because we've been together now two years and sex and passion and desire drop off after the first year, that can cement itself into place. That can become true. If the story you instead tell yourself is this is temporary, that right now I'm finishing nursing school, my workload is insane, but soon I will be done. And the proof that we will be fucking more when we have a little more time, when I'm a little less exhausted, is that I'm horny right now. But there's a circuit breaker in my head that goes, I'm fucking horny, but I don't have the energy for full-blown sex. I have the energy maybe, sounds like maybe you're masturbating a little bit, great, masturbate together. Tell your boyfriend that sometimes you want to put your headphones on and listen to a dirty story and have a wank with him. Maybe he'd like to eat your pussy and have a wank himself while you listen to your dirty stories on Dipsy, which is wonderful, and lay back and relax. There has to be kind of a low stakes, low cost when it comes to additional physical exhaustion option for you to sexually to stay connected intercourse, especially if you're the one getting fucked. Guys, if every time you said yes to sex, you got your ass fucked, you would say yes to sex less often than you might otherwise. If you're the one being fucked, and I'm just going to go out there on a limb and assume that you, 21-year-old nursing school student, and him, 20-something dude in the trades, it's not you fucking his ass, it's him fucking you. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. And some part of your brain is like, I'm horny and I want to, but I don't physically have the energy reserves to expend right now on being the one who got fucked. So say to your boyfriend, look, we are going to come back. We are going to get back 
in that groove. But right now, what I have the energy for is the marker, is the placeholder, is the flare that we're going to send up that when things get a little less stressy, we will be fucking more. And that is mutual masturbation. Maybe listening to some of those stories together, maybe him watching porn while you put on a blindfold, close your eyes and listen to his story. If you like the stories and he likes visual porn, often true of men and women, women like stories. I'm more like a woman that way. Men like porn. You guys can do that together. Or if you don't need your story when you're with him and he doesn't need porn when he's with you, just masturbate together and make some promises to each other while you masturbate. That as soon as you have the energy, as soon as you have more time for yourselves and each other, you will be fucking like you did when you first met. But you're likelier to do that. You're likelier to fuck like that if you don't tell yourself, oh, this is a natural progression of relationship. Our sex life is deteriorating and that's only gonna pick up pace the longer we're together. Don't tell yourselves that. Occam's razor, the obvious answer is probably the correct answer. And the thing that changed about your relationship was your workload and the pressure you're under and your exhaustion. That's going to, you, you say you're almost done with nursing school. That's going to change and you will start fucking again. I promise you. This episode is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Dipsy brings scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. At Dipsy, you can discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups. Here are just some of the categories you can go try out at Dipsy right now. Enemies to lovers, rough and wild, Irish accent, threesomes, bisexual, romantic, in public, it goes on and on. And there's a growing library of fantasy series with vampires, Greek gods, yum, and fairy smut to help you explore the bounds of your imagination and your pleasure. New content released every week at Dipsy, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, as one does, as I do, you can always find something new to explore at Dipsy. And then, after you've had your 10th or 11th orgasm listening to these amazing stories, you can turn on one of Dipsy's sleep soundscapes and drift off so, so happily and so, so satisfied. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, and even heat things up with a partner. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. That's 30 days of full access for free to everything at Dipsy when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage, D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash savage. Go check it out. You won't be disappointed. Dipsystories.com slash savage. Hi, Dan and the Tech Savvy at Risk Youth. I'm reaching out because I truly can't make sense of a recent experience or the most respectful way to handle this. Two nights ago, my husband and I had a male friend over named Willie. Willie brought MDMA, which is normal for us to do on occasion and can be cathartic or simply fun. As the night went on, he began to talk openly about not connecting sexually enough with his own partner, a dear friend we'll call Wendy because she has trauma associated with sex. We don't know the extent of this, but we felt comfortable explaining that my husband himself has had sexual trauma and that we've worked through it in our 10-year relationship. Then we all gave each other massages while we were really high, and it ended up in a threesome. Our first for my husband and I, and super duper fun. Later on in the evening, Wendy was texting me, and she's asking me where Willie was, and that it was extremely surprising to her that he hadn't come home that night. She continued to text me that she thinks now that he's leaving her and that she was really sad. We were really shocked to see those texts. My husband and I assumed that one, she knew where he was, and two, based on an earlier conversation, that they had an open relationship. Now I'm feeling really guilty about doing all of this without her knowledge. Is it on me and my husband to tell Wendy what happened? I feel ready to take on the pain of keeping this secret if it keeps her from suffering. I also really want to still be friends with her and truly love her. I just don't know how to act around either of them. 
We both feel upset that Willie wasn't more forthcoming. We spoke with him briefly about Wendy's text the next morning, and he seemed to brush them off and said he would call her. P.S. On the good side, this has been really awakening for my husband and I. We realized we'd like to hook up with couples in the future, but under clearer circumstances. It's a shame our first threesome comes with all of this baggage. So this is 75% Willie put you two in an awkward position and 25% or maybe a little more than 25% you put yourself in an awkward position. Somebody came over bearing MDMA, things got flirty and you went for it. You had the three way and you assumed based on evidence, based on what, based on intimations, based on hints that Wendy and Willie were in an open relationship. Turns out they're not. You didn't do your screw diligence in that moment when things started to get hot and heavy. You know, when somebody that you might want to fuck who's partnered begins to make a move on you, it really is your responsibility. If you don't want to get mixed up in drama and implicated in drama for you to say to that person, your relationship... I've gotten the impression it's open, right? And I'm certainly getting the impression right now that it's open. I just want to make sure this is okay with Wendy because we're friends too. And I don't want to suck your dick and then get in trouble with Wendy or have things be weird. You guys didn't say that. You should have. He didn't say anything to you. He should have. And now you're in this incredibly awkward position. And what do you do? Do you go to Wendy and spill the beans? No, you go to Willie and say, dude. I, we we fucked up a little, you fucked up a lot. And now we're in this incredibly awkward position and eventually she's going to find out. And we would appreciate if you told her what happened and there'll be some fallout and maybe our friendship with Wendy will survive the shit show coming and we'll all have to apologize to Wendy, us as a couple, you as her partner, for what we did under the influence of MTMA. And we failed. You failed her as a partner, and we kind of failed her as a friend because in the moment, we went with what we hoped was true. We engaged in a little horny MDMA-inflected motivated reasoning, some dickful, twatful thinking. And now you know. You know, we learned from experience. You've had this experience. You've put yourself in this incredibly awkward position with somebody that you like, with Wendy. And ultimately, the relationship, that friendship may not survive what Wendy is likely to experience as a betrayal, not just a betrayal at her boyfriend's hands and dick, but a betrayal at your hands and your husband's hands and dick. So you're going to have to shoulder the consequences. You have to live with the consequences and then do better in the future. The next time some hot dude that you're kind of into has a partner at home comes over with MDMA, ask, ask if it's okay with their partner before you sit on that deck. This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep, the official mattress of the Savage Love Cast. I have a Helix mattress. My boyfriend has a Helix mattress. My guest room has a Helix mattress. Your imagination can take it from there. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and even mattresses made just for kids. To figure out which mattress is right for you, take the Helix Sleep Quiz to find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. And then your personalized mattress will be shipped straight to your door free of charge. But you will get, with your mattress, a 100-night sleep trial. You can try out your new mattress, see how your body adjusts, and if you decide it's not the best fit, you are welcome to return it for a full refund. Helix offers models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side, like me, or models with more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. Helix mattresses all come with a 10 or 15 year warranty depending on the model. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired magazines. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to fix for improving your sleep. And right now for my listeners, Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage to get 20% off and those two free pillows. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Hi, Dan and Nancy. 
I'm a bisexual woman in my 30s living in the Northeast. I'm calling to ask for some advice. I have been in a relationship with a man on and off for three years. We have a very intense, loving, passionate relationship with a lot of care and support. Um, But whenever we have tried to be committed, life partner type, it doesn't seem to work out for various reasons, including communication styles and different priorities and preferences in terms of lifestyles. But we have recently broken up again. um, And now we are in a position where we're lovers and friends, but seeing other people. I am very busy and um, have no desire to date for the sake of building a romantic or committed or relationship. So I am very much only dating people who are in open partnerships where there's really no commitment involved and I have no space or desire for that. Whereas he is looking, he wants a life partner. He wants someone who wants to live with him. And those are things that I'm not able to give or commit to with him. And I am clear on that now and been clear with him on that. So I want him to date and that's great. But, you know, he's still very affectionate and available to me at all times. And he's starting to talk to some people and is about to start going on dates with women who probably want to find romance and a life partner as well. And I am afraid of losing that affection slowly or suddenly to to someone else um, and kind of want to hedge my bets and get some real space for a while and, and revisit our relationship down the line and maybe give him some more space to be with other people. But we don't want to lose each other and we're in love. So I'm confused about what to do. He says he's a grown up. He can make these decisions about whether or not he wants to keep seeing me in these circumstances. But I don't know if I want to open myself up to the pain of him starting to give his attention more and more to someone else in affection and eventually not be able to give it to me because of his new relationships. What should I do? You should shit or get off this guy's face. He's in love with you. You're in love with him, but you don't want to be with him in a committed relationship. That's not working for you. And yet you can't quite seem to let him go. This is, you know, I'm going to make generalizations about men and women, 4 billion, 4 billion, hundreds of millions of exceptions out there. This is something that men sometimes talk about with female exes who want to remain in their lives but also still want to be the center of their lives, want to not just maintain a relationship, but maintain their primacy emotionally with this person who wanted more from them than they were willing to give and that they rejected, but want to keep their hooks in. Don't be like that. Yeah, you are going to lose him. It's great if you guys can make the shift from we're dating and we're staring at that relationship escalator. Nope, we're not going to get on the relationship escalator. We're just going to be friends with benefits. But I really love you. I really have strong feelings for you. And so I can't watch you catch feelings for someone else because I'm going to be jealous that somebody else is getting from you the stuff I still want for myself, but going to be your priority because they could also give you things that I don't want to give you or have things with you that I don't want to have with you. A serious commitment, a relationship. Yeah. He's going to find somebody else that he falls in love with, who falls in love with him. And that person is going to take up the lion's share of his time and attention and affection. And you had to know that, right? When you ended this relationship, you had to know that, that that was an inevitability. All relationships end. You know, people are together for 50 years and somebody dies. Rarely do people both drop dead at the same moment. And so this relationship, as it exists right now, this very loving, intimate, connected FWB relationship, there was always a window where this was going to make sense. 
and where you guys could enjoy this for what it is now fully, but at some point you're going to meet somebody else, he's going to meet somebody else, and your new partners would be understandably threatened that you want your friend with benefits to feel more strongly romantically about you than they do about the partner who is available to them romantically and emotionally and open to commitment and getting on that relationship escalator. You don't get to ask the universe or a person for that. You don't. You don't. So what you say to each other is this is going to hurt. We're still here for each other and emotionally available and we're still loving each other and we're still fucking each other. But tick tock, this is not forever. The way we are living and relating to each other now, this can only continue to exist while we are essentially single, friends with benefits, but single. And you will have to let go of the expectation that you will be the most important person in his life, emotionally, and his first priority when it comes to this kind of love and affection. That is naturally going to shift onto another woman or women when the right woman or women come along. And at that moment, you need to step aside gracefully and wish him well and send him off into that future. And at that point, you may have some other man or person in your life, but don't do that toxic bullshit thing where you never let him go and you sabotage any relationship that he might get in because you want him on your terms but you also want to possess all of his emotional attention, availability, all of his romantic affections, even if you don't want everything that usually comes bundled with that kind of affection or attention or focus. So yeah, enjoy this. It's temporary. It ain't going to last. It ain't supposed to last as it exists right now. And everything that you fear there's going to be somebody else who's going to supplant you in his life. That's absolutely what is not just going to happen, but what is supposed to happen and what you should want to happen for him and for you. All right. Before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to share a couple of listener comments about last week's show posted at savage.love. I delegated last week's intro to chat GPT. Jesse wasn't impressed by the results, but was reassured. I put this episode on while I was struggling to correct Adobe's generative AI, and I was laughing at its results while telling myself there's no need to worry about it replacing retouching jobs anytime soon. The intro to last week's show was a perfectly hilarious audio accompaniment to my work. Thank you so much, Dan. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to leave such a delightful comment. It made my day to read that your experience of the episode added a bit of humor to your work with Adobe's generative AI. Your kind words and feedback mean a lot to me, and they serve as motivation to continue creating content that brings joy and value to my audience. So once again, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I hope to continue providing content that you enjoy. Warm regards. Your name here. Sorry, Jesse. I couldn't resist asking ChatGPT to write my thank you note to you. For your comment. Says my cat is cool? Me, listening to the chat GPT generated intro. Oh God, no, please make it stop. And for the record, Dan, when you hear the phrase artificial intelligence, you are simply seeing a marketing buzzword being puked up for the millionth time. Machine learning, what chat GPT is, is simply really, really good at finding things that fit together. It cannot perform true calculations. It cannot apply logic or reasoning. It's just really good at predicting which word should come next. And as we've seen all the times I've tested chat GPT, it cannot give good or useful sex advice either. In other tech news, after the sale of Donald Trump's Truth Social for $5 billion fucking dollars, Delta 35 says Dan should launch a social media company and take it public. Truth Social reached 8 billion, pardon me, not 5 billion, with 2 million active users and it's a cesspool. Savage Love is a gem of engaged followers, pro-sex Silicon Valley types who might be listening, fun Dan launching his own social media platform. He deserves it. Ah, eh, I don't know. I could launch a social media platform, but Dan is too lazy. And Savage Love is a cozy and pervy little corner of the internet. 
It is not a personality cult with self-interested billionaire backers. So probably not going to happen. But hey, if there are any billionaires out there listening who want to write me a 10-figure check for what I'm already doing, feel fucking free. All right. For more listener comments, more of my responses, check out Struggle Session, the weekly bonus column for Magnum Subs. It goes up every Thursday at savage.love. It is where you will find not only more listener comments, more of my responses, but also the Muppet-faced man of the week. And now, listener response calls. This comment is about the man who called in the last episode in the 24 relationship with his husband. And I disagree with your advice to stay married and basically just hack it up for the sake of the family and the kid. He's in a sexless, it sounds like pretty unhappy marriage. It sounds like his husband can't even talk about emotions or sex and, you know, playing things off with sarcasm is not a healthy way to go about a short, a short or long-term relationship. I think that staying together just for the kid is honestly like playing into that Catholic guilt thing, which seems really ironic in this case. And it's a burden on a child to see at least one of his fathers unhappy. Hey, Dan, I'm calling about the most recent sex and politics show with uh, Rob Henderson. So I really enjoyed the conversation between the two of you. But the question at the end about the woman who was thinking about fucking her boss, and you told her to fuck her boss? No! And I think on previous shows when people have talked about fucking a, a superior or somebody that they work with that you recommended against, against it, that's a horrible idea to fuck your boss. That would open you up to so many awful situations for the both of them. So, yeah, I thought you were really off base there. Maybe recommending that she bring it up to her husband and they could talk about it while they fuck. And it would help get her off and spice up what sounds like an already great sexual relationship. But to actually fuck her boss? No, no, not not even if he has an open relationship. That would just be a catastrophe. Dan, your response to the woman who wanted to fly in her 34-year-old boyfriend from 5,000 miles away and relieve him of his virginity was right on. Speaking as a guy who narrowly avoided being the 40-year-old virgin, I can say that if someone else, no matter how well-intentioned, had decided to put an arbitrary date on a calendar and tell me that's the day I was going to, quote-unquote, lose it, the pressure would have cut any possible boner I could get right off at the knees. There was never anything wrong with me. I was plenty horny for my teens through my 30s, but I am also rather introverted and had a natural preference to wait for the right time and the right person. It may not be entirely this guy's fault that he doesn't have the words to talk about sex. As you get older, it becomes more and more difficult to find peers you can talk sex with without them looking at you like, what is wrong with you and why don't you know these basic things? I've been with my awesome partner for over three years now. She and I both have a small range of relatively vanilla little kinks that we talk about and explore joyfully. I'd just like to say to the 30-year-old virgin, the right time and person eventually happened for me. It will happen for you also. And we're going to leave it there. We've got three ways for you to get us your questions or your comments for future shows. You can record at savage.love slash askdan. Or you can make a voice memo on your phone and email us your question or your comment to q at savage.love. Or you can call our landline like olden times and leave us a message at 206-302-2064. Audiences are getting humped all over the place this weekend. My dirty little film festival, Hump, will be screening in theaters in Oakland, New York City, Baltimore, Missoula, and Bellingham. And then it's on to Berlin, Germany, where I will be personally hosting screenings to catch Hump Part 1, our spring tour. Go to Hump filmfest.com and get your tickets now and while you're there click on submit and find out how you can get your five minute or less dirty little porn masterpiece into hump 2025 follow me on instagram and threads at dan savage follow me on blue sky at dan savage and you can still find me at the bad place at fake dan savage follow dr eric sprankle on threads and instagram and twitter at dr sprankle the Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy. We will all be back at you next week on an installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you for downloading. <laughs>